Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Well, today, my friends, it is a Tell Dell Tuesday, and I do have a wonderful guest for you. And I've had this guest on a couple times before because his story is unbelievable. However, today, I've got a lot of material that I'd like to cover with this gentleman about what's going on last year, this year, and so on and so forth, because he's really deep inside the know of what's going on in the Apartment Association. So let me do this first, because his story is so unbelievable. If you haven't heard it before, and you need to hear it. If you've been here before, if you know anything about lifestyles, you've heard this story 10 times, but I'm going to give you the brief and the short version of it. At a very young age, around 18 years of age, he, his father asked him, would you rather take your college funds and go into business or go to college? Told his father he'd rather go into business, so him and his father looked around for a business to start. They came to Lifestyles Unlimited. They decided to try apartments. They went out. They bought some single-family houses. He progressed to a small apartment complex in which his dad had allowed him to run the entire project. He ran that for a year or so during the toughest times we had in the real estate business, right during a crash, came out the other side okay, and moved on to a very large syndication in which his father had put a lot of money in along with a lot of other people, and he made them a massive profit. I don't even want to remember the exact numbers, so since I don't remember exactly, but I will tell you it's in the millions, okay? Somewhere around $3 million, 300% return on this deal, I think it was. Somewhere in those numbers, but I don't know. But the bottom line is he went on after that, to do syndication after syndication at a very young age. I mean, he started about 18 and he's 30 some years old right now, been doing it for about 10 years, 12 years. And um, I'll let him tell you more of his own personal story. But the bottom line was he became not only a good investor, but he won many, many, many local state and national awards. He was the National Apartment Association Investor of the Year. He also did something no other Lifestyles member has ever done. He won the overall property of the year for the National Apartment Association. So he's got tremendous amount of rewards behind him. As a young gentleman that he is, uh, who is very religious and takes that to work with him every day, uh, who is homeschooled and believes in you know, doing the right thing for people. He has given back. He joined the apartment association. He worked his way through the leadership program, Lyceum training program they have. And uh, as of this year, he has become the Houston Apartment Association's president. And last year, when he was president-elect, he was tagged to lead a team of people to go out there to the apartment association and Houston slash state coalition to try to overcome the COVID problem in the apartment industry. And his stories will go on and on and on forever because of all that went on last year. He's got a lot to say. I want to get to that part and what he sees as the future as for this interview today, because all the other stuff is great as it is. He's got even more to share with everybody. So with no more to say about his past, let's welcome John Boriak. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, Dale. It's a pleasure to be here. Sorry to take your entire history and condense it into a soundbite, but uh, <laughs> I, I really did want to get you up-to-date material because you've got so much now because of being president of the Houston Apartment Association. And of course, last year being in charge of the task force, I think you were in charge of it. There's a lot to say. Let's start first before we get into the Apartment Association stuff. Last year was one of the most difficult operational periods that I've gone through in my 30 years in real estate because... People didn't have any jobs. They didn't have any money. Up. You know, we've had times when we couldn't get money, and we've had recessional periods. But last year was really something different because even when people couldn't pay you, you couldn't evict them. So you really had to figure out a new way of operating. I know all of us did, and you kind of had a head start. Of, not a head start. You were you were a shining light in down the tunnel. You had experimented with a bunch of stuff and got it out there in front of everybody and made it work. Talk about what you did last year and uh, how it turned out for you. Yeah, last year was 
super interesting, like you were saying. We, we got hit with a uh, crazy dynamic where we had so many people that um, either couldn't pay rent or at least had difficulty paying rent. They were really no fault of their own. They're, they were blindsided by it as much as we were. So having to develop new tactics and strategies to navigate that difficulty with them was, was very challenging, interesting, and I'm just really honestly very proud of, uh, for sure, all of my team members, but our industry as a whole for flexing, and I don't mean like bragging, but like being flexible in ways that they've never done before, we've never done before as an industry with coming up with, you know, penalty-free payment plan arrangements or, you know, assisting renters with finding rental assistance and just an overall spirit of flexibility and communication and trying to get through the crisis together as much as possible, avoiding like a we versus them mentality and trying to find the win-win solution. We lost the ability to evict in a lot of cases, but yet we got to remember Evictions were always a last resort for, obviously, the renters and the uh, housing providers. Nobody wants an eviction. That's a lose-lose scenario. You, you need it in, for, as a nuclear option, but we would so much rather always communicate with the, with the renter uh, before it gets to that point and try to, to work out a solution as much as possible. So, but when we lose that, it really disincentivizes. We lose the ability to evict through an ordinance or, or a, a local legislation of some kind it really disincentivizes that communication from happening on the front end. So it complicates the overall operational process so, so much. But, you know, we're coming up with ways to try to, you know, overcome that and foster that communication instead was, was really the theme of last year and trying to work together and, and, uh, and get through that. So, John, you talked about flexing. I've used the term pivot. We've, mm-hmm. We had to change our ways of doing business. Did you see or find or hear of or become aware of any people that didn't pivot, that wouldn't just refuse to stretch or flex or pivot and ended up doing poorly because of it? Well, yeah, there's always going to be the the outliers who uh, aren't open to to that change, the environment, and the necessity necessity to adjust or pivot to that change. And I'm I'm happy that those were the outliers. I would say it's definitely uh, not the commonplace situation. Um, But there there certainly were those, and those are usually the ones that got the, you know, ended up on the news and um, their occupancy dropped tremendously and did not fare as well as those who were able to kind of quickly and nimbly adapt to the new environment. It's like everything around us changes, and if you keep doing things the same way you've always done them, you're going to flop. There's no way to, to survive in that. It's like the you know, you're, it's like if you're climbing a mountain and then you get to a higher altitude and the oxygen level drops. Well, you got to adjust how you're walking and how you're breathing and you know, doing all the things you normally do at that new environment at a higher altitude. And if you don't adjust, you're not going to make it. I agree. And uh, I was surprised, John, that how many people did flex or did pivot and turned it around. Um, I know myself, it was one of the situations where it was very difficult at first because we really didn't know where to go. Then we all sort of started talking to each other and we were you, you were sending stuff out and lifestyles were sending stuff out and apartment association everybody was working at coming up with a new way to go about this and the truth of the matter is immediately on my properties we took a hit went down into the low 90s some properties even high 80s but then it came back once you guys had figured out how to make it work we're now back to 97 percent and have been that for two months now so i think it's a really interesting how about you what did your properties? i know you took a hit for a while too but you were in the beginning far ahead of everybody you were really rocking it yeah we, we started the year out i would say in the, in the mid to high you know 90 percent occupancy which is where we like to run things but and uh, certainly saw a, a, a small drop in that but really you know because of um the way we chose to operate and pivot like you were saying our occupancy never took that big of a hit and we, we stayed in the 90s that i think every property throughout the entire year the bigger crunch on our operations happened in the form of, you know, those renters who had difficulty paying rent. So our, our unpaid rent amount uh, grew and flooded. All right, John, we gotta, we're going to have to take a break, John. You're going to have to take a breath. We'll take a break and we'll yep. be right back with John Boriak, the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Now, from the files of Del Wamsley. I'll never forget when I got my first rent house and somebody sent me like a $600 check. That was the rent. I could, this is my money. <laughs> I was like, man, that's unbelievable. It just comes to you. Now, you do what you want with it. Well, I think I better pay my bills. I think I better do this and that, whatever. But the bottom line is it comes to you. Whereas you, I remember working for corporate America, and we would sell health club memberships, about 200000 250000 bucks a week in memberships. And we'd pile all that money up and take it to the bank. 
And then the company would get the money and they'd do all the accounting, pay all the bills, and boom, we'd get a paycheck back. But you know, the paycheck in many cases was smaller than even one day's worth of receipts. Once I started owning rent houses and getting check after check after check to where I had over a hundred some houses, it just blew my mind. To this day, it still blows my mind each month because I find myself doing two things. I find myself anticipating what was last month's profits. In other words, we, we add them all month as we calculate. So we're able to track the income. Well, it's usually one month behind, but we can track the income now that we know what we've taken. What was the profit? Although there were a few things, like my 17 different savings accounts I have, that pay interest that don't pay to the end of the month. We'll be right back with the Del Wobbly Radio Show. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. This is a radio show with me here today is John Boriak. John is a childhood real estate investment star, a national, a local state and national apartment association award winner and now this year he's elected president of the houston apartment association as we went to break john was explained to you that his properties did well last year uh, even though there was a massive pandemic to deal with and he had found a way to flex and twist and pivot to get through it and make it work i know john you also pride yourself on how you take care of your employees how you care about your customers how you care about your investors in other words you have a moralist based business probably as much as if not more than anybody I've ever seen how are you now taking that to the apartment association how does that same John Boriak type touch work moving into a public arena yeah so the apartment association has a big job to do this year and I'm honored to, to help lead that that charge you know we have a big role to play just like we did last year and I, I think if I were to boil it down the two main focuses that the Apartment Association provided to members, including last house members, would be education and advocacy. So for education, it's going to be so important this year to keep everybody in the loop with what's going on, the latest regulatory changes and ordinances that are coming down the line from a, a legal standpoint, and also the assistance programs that are available. There's a large federal rental assistance program that just got passed along with different um, you know, stimulus packages and then local programs. And so keeping everybody on the same page with that is going to be super important. One of the ways we're doing that is a monthly legal lowdown or legal roundup where HA will, will host this, this monthly uh, class or webinar to gather up everything that happened that month and all the changes and best practices and present, present it in a digestible format once a month to keep everybody on the same page. And up to date. And then from an advocacy standpoint, it's going to, with our elections that just happened, it's going to be more important than ever to stay engaged with our local elected officials, especially our judges, to make sure that you know, our industry's interests are represented and that the, uh, especially the judges are, are educated as to how to run their court in this uh, COVID environment. And you know, evictions still need to proceed, especially for conduct issues and things like that. And so staying on the forefront of keeping everybody educated with what's going on and then making sure our industry's interests are represented in the uh, elected official realm is going to be super important. Now, are they running those uh, courts via Internet, or are they back live again? You know, there's, there's been a variety of strategies and tactics that's mostly been left up to the individual judges for how they want to run their courthouse. So you have some people who have chosen to try, try to figure out a virtual, you know, basically a, a Zoom courthouse and, and run the trials that way. You have some people who are back in person, you know, with some COVID protections in place. And you have some people who just said, we're going to not do process any eviction. Uh, right now, at least for another month or so, or and so it's having to navigate which courthouse to go to in my precinct and how they're operating is another big issue or, or, or difficult water to navigate right now. And, it, and, it, and it's hard because it changes per courthouse and individual property. So what I'm seeing on the news right now, besides all of the presidential nonsense that's going on, the thing that gets me the most is that they're saying that the COVID is getting worse and that more and more people are dying at a faster rate, 
more and more people are becoming infected by COVID at a faster rate. And I'm just wondering, do you see that out there? Is what, what I'm saying is, are you seeing effects that are, do you think there's going to be even a more difficult work environment this year? How do you see the future? You know, it, it's kind of a, a mix of, of both in that, you know, last year, we had just one blindside hit after another. You had COVID come in and then the cases spiking and then coupled that with eviction moratoriums. And here comes a rental assistance program and you have these PPE requirements and everything was just crazy. And so this year, I think we're going to continue to have more challenges, but I feel like we're we're more battle hard and we know how to respond better. So yes, you're going to get cases on the rise, but at the same time, you have businesses who are figuring out how to still operate and serve customers in the chaotic environment. At the same time, you have vaccines that are rolling out and more and more of the population is getting vaccinated on a daily basis. And so it's this flurry of factors and which side or which which one is going to have the biggest impact is still kind of hard to be seen. But I feel like we're more, like I said, battle-hardened, prepared to pivot and make those decisions and deal with the, the new situations that come down the pipeline far better this year than we were last year. So, John, other than being a passive investor, I've sold off all of my Class C properties, and I only have Class A's. So I'm going to ask you a question about the differentiation between A, B, C, and D as far as the COVID. Before I say that, I saw a news article today while I was uh, working out this morning, and it was talking about lower L.A., East L.A. or Southern L.A., where there's the very low socioeconomic bracket, minority-driven, brown and black individuals. And what they're saying is that they are having 70% more COVID deaths than the rest of California put together. Then they come back and they say, well, look, these people have 75% more diabetes and 75% more obesity than the rest of the state. And so it's just logical that there's 75% more people dying from COVID. So let's correlate that for a second to people and understand there is class A, class B, class C properties. And C is the lower socioeconomic, what we used to call blue collar housing. And what I'm wondering, John, is it being out there in the middle of all this as the president of the Department Association, are we seeing differences by socioeconomic bracket as to how hard people are being hit by this? Yes. The majority, I would say, of the job loss that's still out there has been in the retail, restaurant, and uh, you know, hospitality sectors, which as a demographic tends to live in Class B, Class C apartment communities. So while there's still, but it, that's one factor, is that you have those those residents who are maybe getting hit a little harder than the residents who would live in Class A from the uh, job loss standpoint. But at the same time, there is a continued demand for that more uh, affordable level of, of housing because you have uh, people who were in maybe other brackets or the, the really high-end Class Bs who are getting whose budgets a little crunched right now. So now they need to find something a little more affordable to live in, and they're moving into our, our Class B and C communities. And so I like being in that space because mine are more, whether we some of the upper Class C or Class B uh, apartment communities. And I like being in that space because there's always demand for that affordable you know, clean, functional, safe housing product that's out there. You know, in times like this, we have people who maybe were living in a higher rent place that are feeling some crunch and need to move maybe down into a more affordable housing product that we provide. And then when things get better and jobs come back and people are able to uh, you know, have a little more income coming in, they'll want to upgrade it. So when you have people who are living in the maybe C minus communities or the D communities want a better, safer place to live and live, bring their families to, then we're going to have more demand coming from the bottom pressure up up into our communities there. So no matter where the economy goes, there's always going to be demand for that affordable kind of class B and, and upper C product. So I'm going, to, I'm going to take that from you, John. I'm going to go into a break, but I'm going to say it this way. You are living the dream of providing the best product at the best price, which draws from the bottom and the top. We'll take a short break. Be right back with John Boriat and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Listening to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell will be right back with more life changing principles in just a few minutes. Welcome back. 
Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show with me here today on Tell Dell. Tuesday is John Boriak. John is a childhood real estate investment star. He's also a local, state, and national apartment association real estate investor award winner and has won many, many awards, including the largest award you can possibly win, which is Property of the Year, Best Property in the whole United States of America, one year. Currently, John has just become president of the Houston Apartment Association. We've been discussing what they did last year and what they're doing this year. John, let's move the topic along to the next level, which is as a real estate investor yourself and syndicator, what do you see for the future of real estate? State this year. Do you see any deals available? Or tell us what you see for investing here in the near future. Sure. So, you know, we for the last few years, we've been on a pretty rapid price appreciation run where, you know, returns are diminished and, and prices are higher than they've ever been. And, and when COVID hit last year, we were all expecting this big you know, price crash, and it really didn't happen. You know, prices went down five, maybe 10 percent. Volume was down, but the volume has come back just in the last month or so, you know, January, you were seeing a lot more. I don't know if there's the deal count is up as far as deals close, but there's just a lot more action, a lot more talk, and people seem more comfortable, ready to do deals again. And so I kind of see the first half of this year as continued, I'm going to call it squeezed operations where delinquency maybe grows. You see a lot of concessions sneaking back into the market, which hurts your cash flow. That may put some distress on the deals, and we might see some more motivated sellers during this kind of first half of the year as they they deal with those issues. But I suspect things will kind of pick up in the second half of the year as we get, you know, the the federal rental assistance programs completely rolled out. And, you know, like I said, more of the population gets vaccinated as the economy starts to turn again. I suspect we'll be back to that that price appreciation out there the second half of the year. And then what I think the bigger picture, the more macro multiple year economic trend is going to be is, you know, last year we had incredible amounts of federal stimulus get plugged into the economy through the, the individual stimulus checks, the PPP programs supporting the small businesses and, and so many other you know, bills just unprecedented amounts, I hate to use that word, unprecedented amounts of, of money that was basically borrowed from the future and injected into the economy today. And what that's, I think that's going to do, I suspect, is you're right now a good amount of that money, or at least it was intended to be in the hands of the individual consumer, the individual person, and small businesses. But as they spend that money, that incredible amount of money that just got injected into our economy, I suspect it will get consolidated into more institutional funds and institutional uh, you know, corporations and equities that, that are going to be looking for places to invest that money. And so any investment that has a yield component that can have some kind of cash flow associated with it, like multifamily real estate, is going to be a hot target for all that money that has to be put to work somewhere, which means we're going to see more and more money chasing that cash flow, which is going to lead to higher prices, which reduces the percentage of cash flow. So I suspect over the long haul, the next few years, we'll see smaller amounts of cash flow in deals, not because the operations suffered, but I I mean, not dollar cash flow, but return, the returns on that that investment, because people are going to be willing to pay more for that cash flow stream. So we'll see capital gains go up. I think prices will, will, will appreciate over the next few years. Uh, but the cash flow streams on a percentage basis may be kind of kept reduced in that kind of lower single digit range as more and more money chases those cash flow streams and, and keeps those interest rates down on the loan. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think you must have seen the, uh, the Economist that Jerry Turner sent out to me. I'd probably send it out to you too and watch that his little piece. And I agree with it 100% Mm -hmm. that that's where we're going. The one thing I wonder though is if the COVID creates individuals, right? And this is what's happened in the past. I'm going to try to make a short version of it. In the past, if you ran your property poorly and you would normally have to sell it at a lower price, that isn't happening right now because there's so much money chasing so little inventory that 
and I'm not talking about just apartments. I'm talking about in the world, just like you said. There's too much money in the economy. And so it's forcing itself into every place where there is cash flow or where there's profit. And so they're able to hold these prices up, even though those operators don't even have the NOI to be able to make the deal work. So the question comes down to how do they finance these things, John? Are they paying larger and larger down payments because the NOI won't carry the debt coverage necessary for these higher prices? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big question. I think lenders are mitigating that risk by requiring higher down payments, like you're saying. You know, gone are the days of only having to put 20 or 25% down on a property. You're looking at easily 30% or more now, normally when so the I think lenders are hedging their bets that way. And then also just the interest rates are so low that it takes less cash flow to cover that debt and meet their debt service coverage ratio requirement because the debt service is lower as interest rates are low. So as long as those interest rates stay down and there's enough cash in the market to pay that that higher down payment, I don't see how why the lending would stop. You know, that and again, I'm not the expert. I'm just like you said, a parrot kind of repeating what I've heard from smarter people than me. But that's that's a trend we've been seeing so far is people making deals work and as the equity is just willing to take on a bigger risk and, and pay more for a small cash flow stream. Well, like you said, all it's doing is changing the profit from going from cash flow to capital gains. It's just moving it. That's all. Because if everything is compressing cap rates, that means people are making money on the back end of the deal. So it, That's right. the internal rate of return might very well be exactly the same when you get to the end of the deal. So let's go one step further here. Let's go back. You're going to be one of the locations for our bus tour. And the bus tour is we're hoping and we're praying that we can have our expo this year. And if we do so, then we have the bus tour. And your properties, one of your properties, by the way, is going to be on the bus tour. Let's start with a quick analysis. How many properties do you own now? Just curiosity. Yes, yeah, so I have five properties currently that we, we own and manage uh, 1,258 units in total. And the property that you're going to share with us on the bus tour has had some incredible returns, correct? Yeah, this was one of my first deals I bought as a syndicator uh, back in 2012, and it it worked out geographically to be the best fit for the bus tour. But I'm excited because we've never been out there before on the Masters bus tour, and it's it's got such a great story and it's such a great example of the power of real estate investing that I'm excited to to show it off. Well, without embarrassing yourself, share with us the kinds of returns you've made on this thing. Sure. So with this one... It has been uh, phenomenally successful, and I'm happy that we were able to return so much money to the investors. You know, it, it cranks out 20 to 35 percent, you know, annually or on a return basis from just the cash flows. You know, not including any real refinances or anything. But we've also done a couple of, of refinances. The most recent of which was last year, and that refinance was we were able to pull out 80 percent of our initial invested capital and return that back to the investors. But that still left a ton of equity in the deal because we weren't looking for the investors in this deal didn't want a big cash influx right now because the deal's cranking out such great returns. They they aren't able to go redeploy their money and get anything near the, the returns they get in this property. So they they still can't kept the, the LTV low, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent, well, well below what it could have gotten out. But still, over the last, you know, 10, 12, well, I guess it's been eight years that, since we bought that deal, it has returned a cumulative 308 percent of the initial invested capital back to the investors on that on that deal. And it continues to crank out those 20 to 30 uh, percent, re- you know, cash flow returns every single year, even despite the, the headwinds we face. Now, just out of curiosity, I've only got a half a minute left. Is this the property I used to joke about that your dad put his money, a good chunk of money in and came back and made almost everything back that he ever said he'd save for you for your uh, college degree? This is the one. Yeah, this one. This is the, the golden the golden goose. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you think about this. Your father puts up uh, whatever it is, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars and gets it back 300 percent return on your money. And John still ended up with the college education because after all these businesses, all this work, getting married, multiple kids, all of that going on. He still had time to go get a college degree at night. How did you do it all, John? You got 30 seconds to answer that. It was uh, a lot of help from a lot of people, you know, work, working in the business during the day and then doing online distance learning at night to, to get that degree locked down. And it's been a, it's been a huge blessing. Well, when we come back, we'll talk about that blessing, that lovely family of yours and the lifestyle that you've created by doing what you've done at such a young age. Now, from the files of Del Wamsley. We're in a situation right now where people are buying assets, big assets, large apartment complexes, expensive homes massive amounts of real estate 
as a hedge. And what are they hedging? They're hedging inflation because real estate is a inflation hedged asset. It goes up when everything else goes up. Now, the reason why real estate is so good as a hedge is because unlike gold, which may go up and down with the, the value as inflation occurs, it doesn't put off any income. And so real estate is producing income. It's producing rental income for the people that are doing it the right way. So whether or not my asset goes up or whether it doesn't, I'm hedged because I'm going to get income either way. Now, if there's massive inflation, then my asset keeps up with inflation. We'll be right back with John Boriak and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Now, from the files of Del Wamsley, here Del talks about what's truly important in life. I've spent the last two days out in the sun by my ponds, cleaning my ponds, feeding my fish, working on the yard, just enjoying the beauty and that, and to me, is being well-invested. It's well-invested into the things in life that are most important. I have been able to get myself back into motivation to lose weight, get in shape, work out on a regular basis, because I, too, have all those things that come up in my life. So, again, just simply stating to you, as someone who has been able to overcome the negative force of inertia, to want to sit and do nothing, to be able to motivate yourself to take action, how much better off is your family? How much weight have you lost? How many times have you told your spouse that you love him or her? How many times have you told your children you love them? How many times have you gone and done something with them to perpetuate the family and or their life? What can you look back to in these last months and say, wow, that made a real difference to our lives? With me today here for Tell Dell is John Boriak. Like I said earlier, John has uh, been around for about 10 years and uh, started as a young entrepreneur, developed a very large uh, portfolio of real estate, has won local, state, national awards, and is now president of the Houston Apartment Association. John, what an incredible life. Wife, how many kids do you have now? I can't keep up with you. Here, good. We have three kids. I got a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. Yeah, you just keep sneaking them in there on me. Every time I talk to you, there's another one. So you've got a wonderful <laughs> family. I know you, you have lots of hobbies. You hunt and fish. I mean, you're all over Facebook with that kind of stuff. Wonderful marriage, incredible story there about how you met your wife. And why don't you tell us just a brief story with your wife, what it's meant to your family, how you guys build your family, what is your family beliefs, and how you live your life for the rest of the people out there that want to know what the lifestyle's like. I'm so grateful and thankful for the many different perks of of genuinely loving what I do for a living uh, through real estate. You know, I, I met my wife actually at a wedding, but she was already a lifestyle. She and her father were lifestyle members, and so we had that in common, and we were able to, to talk about our interests in real estate. And then fast forward a couple of years, and uh, we got married a week after closing on my first syndicated apartment <laughs> deal, the one where we're going to go see on the bus tour, actually. So that was a pretty wow. crazy time there, but oh, what, a, what a cool story. And now fast forward, and, and I can, you know, everybody says, yeah, you know, they love the you know the goal is to find something where you love what you do and it works not work if you love it and I know there's a lot of cliches around that but I I genuinely love what I do I I miss it sometimes when we're on vacation out of town for an extended period of time and I can't wait to to get back at it I I love leading a company that allows our team members to be treated well and be rewarded for their work and find fulfillment in what they do and be given the the tools and training that they need to achieve their potential and see their lives get turned around by working with us at our apartment communities. And then, you know, as we work with our team members, I love working with them to provide a product, that, that being an apartment home, that allows our renters who choose to live in our communities to have a clean, 
functional, safe place to call home and raise their families and have that refuge is such an important cornerstone of, of, of them having a successful you know, life and family. And then in addition to all those rewarding things, I get the flexible work schedule that lets me spend so much time with my family and friends. You know, my, I'm very involved in my kids' lives. Very rarely do I ever miss breakfast or dinner. You know, just this morning, I was able to, to go with my wife to take our youngest daughter to you know, her first day at school and drop her off and see her off there. So to be able to be part of those moments, not miss any of those, those important cornerstones in my kids' lives as they're growing up is invaluable to me. And having the flexibility to do other things, you know, you mentioned the hunting, fishing, the hobbies, but also all the work I do at the Apartment Association. That, that, that's a big time commitment, and it's so rewarding to be able to work with the really smart people in our industry who are members of that association also, and, and be on committees with them and rub shoulders with them. Like, I grow so much personally through that, but I wouldn't be able to do that if, if I didn't have the flexible work schedule that I have. So, so many perks that, that come with it, and it's such a, a rewarding life being able to, to give back in many different ways and, and be plugged into my family and provide that that good in the world to our, our company, the way we treat our employees, the products we provide to our renters, the returns we provide to our investors. You're always thinking that win-win situation with everybody. Well, you're quite an inspiration to us out here. If you were speaking to some young gentleman and think back to when you or your dad asked you, would you rather go into business or go to college? Explain how a young person should look at that from your eyes. How do you see the world nowadays for young people getting started yeah, out there? Yeah, I would, I would encourage people to, to figure out how you're going to help others in the world. Let that be the focus. I, you know, I've figured out how to do it through the jobs provide and the product you provide, but how are you going to help others? And, and don't get distracted by only focusing on, on money. You know, money's a bad goal. It will never satisfy you. It'll cause you to do things that aren't, aren't healthy and aren't what you want to do. So money's not a bad thing in and of itself, and it's a byproduct of helping others and, and uh, doing what we do. But don't, don't, let, don't let that be your focus. Don't let that be the end all. You focus on treating people right and doing the right thing and figure out how you're going to help others in your life. Good thoughts all. There's no doubt. You're not someone I would ask the question, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? So I'll change that question a little bit and ask, with what you have done so right, is there anything you look back on and go, I could have done it differently and more effectively? Other than changing the exact timing I got in on the market, <laughs> which I can't really, it wasn't super in my control. You know, that was a, some hard time going going in when I bought, when I first got in the, in the industry, you know, right, right before the financial crisis of 2008. That was some hard times. But I say that I learned so much by operating a business through that crunch and how to, to operate lean and find the best deals and, and make those contacts. So I, I can't even say I, I regret that necessarily. You know, maybe if anything, just learning to rely on my team sooner than I did. You know, the beginning I held too much close to the vest and didn't want to delegate and trust people. And so it, once I found out that, that the people I had on my team were trustworthy, should have let go of a lot of the responsibilities sooner and uh, and could, would have allowed me to grow faster if we had tried to assemble kind of the, the team I have now sooner and delegated more of the responsibility to them. That's always a good lesson and it takes different people different amounts of time to figure that out. It took me a long time also because uh, you're a workaholic or because uh, the worst case is when you think you can do it better than other people. That's the worst case. But sometimes people are just workaholics and they can't get out of their own way. So you've got this presidency ahead of you. You've got a full year coming. What do you see as absolute long-term goal? And you've only got 30 seconds to come up with it. You know, our, our long-term goal is the apartment industry. This year, we got to focus on getting the federal rental assistance program laid out, staying on top of you know, all the new changes. And then at Veritas, my company, we're focusing on cutting out the noise and the, all the distractions being thrown at us by society, focusing on what's really important and what we can really impact, and then eventually you know, growing our, our company so that we can help more people, both you know, through our, our employees and our renters. John, you're quite an inspiration, as I said before, and I want to just thank you very much for everything you do, both by coming on today and what your give back is. For the rest of you out there, remember this. It's not the money. It's the lifestyle. Have a wonderful day. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.